Oh, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, we're in the one year anniversary of when Waddle Canyon fire started and, and happened. Looking back on it now, kind of tell me a little bit about your reaction as to, as to what the community has been through over the past year. Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously uh, almost unbelievable that we just had a major fire that you know, took a lot of homes and here we are coming up on the one year anniversary and now we have another one and this fire really was more devastating than that one and I just I, I couldn't imagine that happening to the same community two years in a row and I know there are still people that are rebuilding as much as they can from last year at this time and uh, to see it happen again it, it's, it's just shocking you have to pinch yourself and ask did this really happen again and the answer is yes it did what was it like when you were going through it? I mean, once the Black Forest fire started, I think everybody knew it had potential to be bad. Um, and then it became worse than Waldo Canyon. Was there a point where you were like, this isn't happening? You know, the, the Black Forest fire was so different in that it began consuming structures immediately. I mean, the fire started around 145, we estimate, or at least that's when the initial calls came in and it was handled with that fire district under mutual aid other agencies were responding and i personally responded around 315 and as i was driving up the interstate the plume of smoke over the fire i mean it just looked so familiar to what we saw a year ago um, and and as i was driving up the interstate i just thought this cannot happen again but there was certainly no doubt in my mind, and as I was driving to Black Forest, I could see the black smoke, I could see the plume cloud forming, and it was pretty clear to me that we had a major fire on our hands. Uh, just wondering exactly where it was, how far it had gone, was really the question, and I also knew there was a lot of wind, and any time you have heat with wind and an ignition source, the fire itself, it's, it's going to spread, then it's a matter of oh no, how many homes are, are being threatened now? How, um, you know, it seems after Waldo, there were, it seemed like dozens of after action reports. It seemed like every week there was another one coming out. How useful were those reports to you at the time? You know, I, I think is what they did is they memorialized what we knew and what we learned every day of the fire. I mean, it's like anything in life. If you do something once, the next time you're going to look at, well, how can I do it better? And not only that, having faced that experience once, you already know kind of what to expect, where you could possibly do, do you know, improve or do uh, a little better. So the document itself that was released to the public was more for the public to review. Just compiling that document is a learning process that you lock away and, and apply it to future events. I mean, that's what experience is about, whether it's doing a a traffic stop or dealing with a, an uprising in the jail. If you have one under your belt or two or three, that's what, that's what the, uh, really the knowledge and the experience comes from is having been through it once. Uh, I had been through other fires prior to the Waldo Canyon fire, but nothing to the magnitude of Waldo Canyon nor the speed at which it moved and the different directions it moved. That's what was really shocking and we saw the same similar behaviors with Black Forest, the main difference is Waldo started in a, a mountainous rural area where there really were no homes immediately threatened. And Black Forest started, I mean, in people's backyards. What were some of the lessons that you took specifically from Waldo Canyon that you were able to apply in Black Forest? You, you know, there's quite a few. I would say the ones that jump out the most are, number one, um, I think most surprising was the speed at which we were able to get air support. And the fact that the type air support we got could fly in the higher winds. That was one of the struggles with Waldo is the larger aircraft kept getting grounded and then we had one or two helicopters and they just weren't as effective whereas with Black Forest we saw a huge difference. But I think the things you, you walk away with from Waldo into the Black Forest is number one how fast it can move, how hot it can burn, and how many directions it can travel. The Black Forest fire moved uh, straight, really straight to the east and to the northeast almost at the same time in two main fire lines and driven by winds within um, a couple hours turned and ran straight north and northwest. 
And at one point, even if you looked at the infrared days later, you saw where it had burned two different forks almost facing up toward the north. But I think another important element is, is having been through Waldo is also knowing what kind of information the public would expect to hear. Obviously, we want to know about containment. That's a popular one. Um, but rather than waiting until the fire was out and going in and assessing homes, that was a lesson learned from Waldo that the sooner we can put people at ease, whether they lost their home or whether they didn't, the better. And getting that information is, is just as important as, uh, or the communication to the public, is just as important as the communication among ourselves that are, that are engaging the fire or performing evacuations and so forth. It seemed to me from an outside perspective that the evacuations happened a lot quicker and were a lot more, went a lot more smoothly. Was that because of things that were learned during Waldo or was that just how it played out this time? I, I think it's how it played out. I mean, for instance, the, the county portions of the, via, of the evacuation with the Waldo Canyon fire, we had time. So it was done in a very systematic, controlled uh, manner. Uh, just like our plans had called for. We didn't have flames hitting on the doors. Um, we also had enough time to where people were spread out and it didn't create traffic congestion. If you leap forward to one year ago today, Tuesday, when the fire came into Mountain Shadows, I mean it moved in so quickly, which is another lesson of how fast it cleared a canyon and uh, descended into the city. Um, there wasn't a lot of time. Flames were coming across the tops of the homes and I think the evacuations uh, were, were done very rapidly, but there was choke points at the major intersections like Garden of the Gods and I-25, Rock Rim and I-25, where I-25 became a, a real choke point. So we tried to apply that to Black Forest, but it was such a different situation because the fire was so dynamic and advancing so quickly. I mean, within a few hours, it consumed uh, a lot of those homes that ended up being in the total numbers and covered a large uh, land mass. Um, but we still had those choke points at major intersections until we could get enough staff up there to get it flowing again. And so that was a similarity we learned then and something we need to look at either using technology or, or overriding uh, traffic control signals to really open it up to keep traffic moving. You were also very um, concerned about the security of the homes in the evacuation area. Was that because of things that were learned in Waldo about people going in and re-victimizing those people? Absolutely. And you know, that was one of the concerns. It, it's kind of twofold because you, you had the people, number one, that were out of their homes. And for instance, along 24 up through Green Mountain Falls, Cascade, Cristola, um, we had an easy time limiting access to the, by the public. So we had a, it, was, it was a much easier area to control access to, and ultimately we didn't have those problems along the uh, Highway 24 corridor. However, when you looked at Mountain Shadows, you had so many either trail systems or different entry points, adjacent communities that were allowed to repopulate. And so that was a lesson learned of how quickly those home, or the burglaries and the the crimes really added up and how people accessed it. In addition to um, uh, having every road or entry point, egress point, uh, with some type of security, um, also saturating the inner perimeter of those burn areas with active patrols. And we had a lot of support from, uh, I mean, every local law enforcement agency provided support, but I'll tell you, getting the guard in within the first 12 to 14 hours was a tremendous asset and it really freed up our guys instead of sitting on checkpoints freed them up to actively patrol within the area and it was an added benefit to the firefighters because now you had law enforcement in there as well driving around in in vehicles that could maneuver the streets a lot easier and calling out hot spots and it, you know i think that's w when you look at the totality of what happened in, with the waldo canyon and when it came into mountain shadows looking at the challenges that the city faced and, and just having witnessed that experience or, or see their after action, then apply it to this, it was just truly a benefit. And it goes back to once you've experienced something, you know, you have a much higher likelihood of improving on it. What was the one single most valuable lesson you think you learned from Waldo Canyon Fire? 
You know, it's hard to narrow down to just one and because you have the fire incident, you have the public concern incident, you have the loss of property. But uh, I think the most valuable one to walk away from Waldo is never underestimate how fast a flame can travel with wind. Number two, make sure you're putting out information as accurate and timely as possible to the public. You can alleviate a lot of community stress, community concern by getting information, even if you don't believe it's 100% sound, as long as that's what you're striving for, if, if you miss one or 2%, it still brings a level of comfort to the citizens, not just in the impacted area, but around the remainder of the community as well. I know you haven't had a ton of time to reflect yet on the Black Forest Fire, um, but have you learned any valuable lessons from that fire that you think you can take moving forward? You know, I don't think there's an incident, whether it's a fire, a law enforcement operation, a jail, a courthouse, anything, where you don't learn something that you carry forward. Um, and, and again, not only did the firefighters do a phenomenal job, but the, the law enforcement personnel that were in there and performing rescues for the first four to five hours, uh, really from about three o'clock on. Um, the exposure that they place themselves in as far as uh, being harm, harm themselves or, or, or even taking enough risk to place themselves in such jeopardy just amazes me. And uh, one of the things I'm looking at right now is, is making sure that in their law enforcement vehicle they have Nomex suits that they can put on to protect themselves because we're never going to be going in or not going in and, and trying to rescue people. And our deputies and CSPD and, and everybody else that responded did such a phenomenal job of doing that that we need to provide them a higher level of protection. Also looking at options of, of having direct contracts with air support so that at the first sign of smoke we can get in the air, see where it is, and have the ability to drop water on it, even if it's smaller amounts in comparison to what we saw taking place up there. I think that's becoming more and more important. And as a community, something we have to weigh the benefits of, it's like an additional insurance policy to aid those firefighters. And then we, we really need to come up with better ways to open the traffic outside that area. I mean, we can control it uh, within the burn area and get people moving out but there's such a bottleneck that's created when that flow of traffic hits major thoroughfares like Woodman Road or, or 83 or even Meridian that we just need to clean those out further down the line and not have a dam effect uh, created. After Waldo, I think there's probably a lot of people who thought this can't happen again. I'm sure after Black Forest, there's more people who are like, okay, it's happened twice. There's no way this is going to happen again. Are you, are you still concerned? Is there still that risk out there that this could happen a third time, a fourth time? You know, um, I, I think a lot of us had this false sense of security that we had our one bad one. It can't happen again. And I think Black Forest Fire is an awakening that it can at any time. Um, I mean, as long as we have the, 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 the drought conditions, the warm weather, and I can't remember the last time we had a summer this far into the year where the wind has blown so much creating these red flag days. Um, I think every day we're at risk, even this year, of a repeat of what we saw in Waldo and a repeat of what we saw in Black Forest. It's just a question of where is it going to come next and from what direction. We still have a lot of timbered area in Black Forest up in the Monument Palmer Lake area. and. I know um, probably even more concerning is Highway 24 South down through Skyway, the Broadmoor area, Broadmoor Bluffs along the 115 corridor. Um, that is equally as dry and, and all it takes, like we, we saw over in uh, South Fork, is a lightning strike and, and a little bit of wind and we could have our hands full again and lose more of our city and, and that's the concern today. The Black Forest Fire was obviously more in your jurisdiction, so you had a, a little bit bigger role this time around than you did in Waldo Canyon Fire. And we got a lot of feedback from the community that they were very impressed with how you handled everything and, and very pleased with the way, um, I believe they said that it seemed like you cared, you weren't a politician up there. How does that make you feel to, to get that kind of reaction from the community? Well, that, that's what I would hope, because I do care. I, I care about um, 
our community as a whole. I care about the economic impact of a Waldo Canyon or a Black Forest uh, from the large businesses and how they're affected to the, the small businesses on, on uh, Shoop Road and Black Forest. I mean, I can't imagine a small business being closed down for two weeks. And, and I'll tell you, it tears at me every time I drive through there and see uh, homes destroyed because it's more than just a place where people lived to many. It's their sanctuary. It's, um, it's, it's where most of their adult memories were formed, whether it's children or, or adults. And I've talked to so many people, especially early on, it just seems I was running into people that lost their home at a rate of five to one. And it just, it, it's terrible. It's terrible to think that one day everything's going fine and the next day you've lost everything you own. I talked to one guy and asked him if they were able to get some of their most prized possessions out of their house and he said, no, my wife had enough time to grab some clothes and a toothbrush, a toothbrush of all things. Um, I talked to another guy who, uh, him and his wife built the house and his two boys when they were in school would come home and he had chores for them to help build that house and they lived in it for over 40 years and um, he's obviously retired now had no insurance um, his his wife passed away a few years ago and that's all he had to remember her by something they shared not only that something they built and in speaking to his two sons who are who are adults now they remember growing up coming home from school and help him put the roof on and it's just those kinds of things and the meaning of that home to that individual is more than just where I live and a roof over my head. It's where they raised a family and something they built with their own two hands and it's something they owned. And, and those stories just, I mean, they hurt. And I saw it hurt people. I knew people that lost their home over in Waldo Canyon, the Mountain Shadows area. And it's not something that should be taken lightly. So I do care. I care about every one of those that lost it. I wish we could have saved one. I wish we could have saved more. Um, and that's what I strive to do every day is find a way to minimize that from ever being repeated. Seeing how the community responded after Waldo Canyon and, and even during Black Forest, do you think we're capable of bouncing back? Absolutely. I, I've been asked that question. You know, this, this El Paso County is, is, is very interesting. Number one, we have a lot of military. We have a lot of retired military. And, um, and, 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 and I think there's just a sense of resilience throughout this community. It, I've never even heard the attitude of, we're not gonna rebuild, it's, it's too risky, it's, it's gonna happen again. Before the fire is even 100% contained, this community from all aspects, all corners of it, began talking about the rebuilding process. And I was asked this, how does a community survive a second event? And my answer is, it's a very resilient community. Maybe it's got a touch of stubbornness to it in a good way. And um, folks here, no matter uh, whether it's a tornado, a fire, or flood, they're going to rebuild. It's our home, and we're going to return it back to the way we could. And it's amazing how when something like this happens, how it actually draws the community a little closer, where you see people from the, the southeast part of the county, the, the southwest, even surrounding communities, coming together to make sure we succeed as a community and it starts with the heart of it and that's why I said absolutely we're going to recover we're going to rebuild and we're going to be quick to let the rest of the country know we're open for business come visit I mean the fires have burnt such a small portion of, of Colorado and El Paso County we still have a lot to offer and over the past couple months you've been in the public eye a lot and there's been a lot of different things that have really put you out there in the front and I gotta ask this question I know there's a lot of people talking about it any chance you're thinking about running for governor no <laughs> I've been asked that question a lot there's a lot of speculation but I really I don't have any intention of doing that um, I love what I do now and I know the time is, is drawing to a close where it'll be time to, to take on new challenges and I'm actually looking forward to doing something different. And although um, running for governor and being governor would be different, uh, I, I have my sights set elsewhere and looking at doing something entirely different outside of government. Uh, I always say this, I will never say it will never happen, but I have no intention of it today and I know I won't in the next year.